Right. So let's crack on then. Um, so uh, thank you for attending. Uh, for uh, anybody that's watching afterwards when it's uploaded to YouTube, which will be the following day, um, sorry you couldn't make it. There will be something at the end of the tasting which will be more of an incentive for people that are attending and then for people that were uh, did get the packs um, and have watched it early on. And I'm going to send everybody a video, um, a, an email out that is due to be on the tasting so that they don't necessarily miss out um, because there is going to be an opportunity to get some of the bottles, which I know basically nobody has anymore and they're going to be at a decent price. So... Um, we do have uh, the chocolates from uh, Chris Corcoran, who hopefully will be joining us at some point because he's on a family trip at London. Um, but we do have with us right at this point is uh, Cal Rob, who is um, like a brand ambassador and sales manager for uh, Spirit Cartel, who are the UK distributors, um, who's been incredibly uh, kind to be able to actually give me uh, some of the, these um, limited edition bottlings. I love Four Roses anyway. Um, it was really good to be able to get it direct. And then when the limited editions turned up and I was like, it's just, it was like, yeah, go on then. Um, so it was a really good excuse to be able to then do this tasting where we've got essentially all of the small batch range. Um, so I've got pictures and things to throw up. Um, but Cal, do you want to start us off by just giving us kind of some background information about Four Roses as the brand, as the distillery, everything like that? Also, the the production process, because that's where it starts to get a little bit complicated in terms of the letters and the mash bills and everything like that. I'm going to try and throw up these, these pictures as and when, and hopefully it'll all tie in nicely. I've kind of got them in a semi-order but I might have to flick back and forth as we go. Um, and then then at that point, once we've kind of done the history, we'll then look at the run-up, but we'll also, um, I just want to kind of throw in there in terms of how we can do this with the chocolates that we've got to kind of make the most of the pairing and the tasting and everything like that. Yeah, so yeah. I'm going to... Tell me how, how to go on the chocolate and I can, I can yeah. talk to you and hopefully uh, it, won't, it won't bore anyone. So yeah, hi everyone. Um, as Ben mentioned, I'm Cal. I work with Spirit Cartel. We import and distribute Four Roses across the UK uh, and I've been with them for five years now. Uh, and Four Roses, as Ben mentioned, has a very, very long and very interesting history. So it starts back in the 1880s. Uh, when Paul Jones was looking at um, setting up his distillery. Um, and this, I'll, the supposed story is that he met a woman at a ball in Kentucky where he'd just moved to because Georgia had become a dry state. Um, and he proposed to this woman and said, if you wear a corsage of roses to the end of your ball, I'll take it that you want to marry me. Uh, skip forward to the end of the ball, and supposedly she turns up wearing a corsage of four roses. Um, and the, the story, the love story behind it. Um, I have been reliably informed, however, that Paul Jones died a bachelor. So how true that story is, I am not 100% sure on. Um, however, it's thought it might be inspired by either his nephew or one of his brothers. Um, and that's where that story comes from. And he, it is kind of turned into a bit of a legend about him himself. So, um, like I say, it started officially in Kentucky in 1888. Uh, and it started at a location called the Old Prentice Distillery. But the brand was called the Four Roses, um, Four Roses Bourbon. And over the next, you know, almost 100 years, right up until the 1960s, Four Roses became renowned for the production of incredible quality value straight Kentucky bourbon. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, to be a to be a, a straight Kentucky bourbon, you need to be aged for a minimum of, of four years, um, or if it's less, you you have to put it on the bottle. It has to be majority corn in the mash bill. And it has to be aged in new oak. Those are the, the three main things. There are a couple of other things like what ABV it's produced up to. Um, they use two types of still that Ben's um, got up there on the left. So we use um, a traditional kind of what's called a, a thumper, which is it's almost like a pot still, but it's copper. And it makes this very unique kind of um, almost like a drum roll sound 
which hence the name of Thumper. Um, and that allows us to to get it to the correct ABV for for bottling, and that's after our fermentation stage. I'll talk about fermentation a little bit more as we kind of get into the 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 codes that we that Ben mentioned earlier. Um, but yeah, so it was originally at the old Prentice site. Um, up until 1960, we were uh, the biggest brand in the United States. There's a famous picture post World War post World War II of a sailor dipping a woman in Times Square. Times Square being the most uh, expensive piece of advertising real estate and a good kind of measure of brands awareness and sustainability uh, sorry sustainability in terms of how recognized they were and on that picture post world war ii you can see in times square ford motors above that is coca-cola and then above that is four roses bourbon we had the most expensive advertising real estate in the u.s because we were one of the most well-known and regarded brands in the u.s at the time then in the 1960s, we were bought by a company called Seagram's, who also owned some Canadian whiskey. And they stopped the sale inside the United States of Four Roses straight bourbon. What they did was they blended in their Canadian whiskey, because for them it was a priority to sell their Canadian whiskey. And they sold it just under the Four Roses blended whiskey label. Um, this was not particularly well received by uh, fans of Four Roses and fans of bourbon in general. And over the next 30 plus years, the reputation of Four Roses kind of fell into a hole. Um, not to put too, too fine a point on it. Um, it became a very, uh, very badly regarded brand, especially considering where we'd been in the 60s. Um, and the sale of Four Roses in certain states just completely disappeared. Then it gets to the early 2000s and Seagram starts selling off assets because they go bust as a company. And during that time frame, Four Roses had become the number two selling bourbon in Japan because the straight bourbon had still been exported to Europe and Japan. Um, so our Japanese distributor at the time decided to buy Four Roses and reintroduce straight bourbon back into the US. So we were able finally to make straight bourbon and start selling again into the United States, which almost felt like we were starting from scratch, having to build the brand and awareness back up. Um, and that's where the kind of modern history of Four Roses starts. And that's led to a few things that we've kind of become synonymous for over the last 20, 20 plus years. So Ben showed some pictures of the aging warehouses there. Uh, we are quite unique in Kentucky in that we age in single st story warehouses. What this means, so you can see there, they're quite flat and low to the ground. Most bourbon distilleries will age in warehouses up to six stories high. And that will have up to almost 40 barrels tall in terms of height, if you can picture that. Um, a story, a single story can comfortably hold six barrels on top of each other and, and have space to, to age. What that also means is the temperature at the top is a lot higher than the temperature at the bottom. So the very variation in aging and how fast that bourbon soaks in the flavor of the wood um, and a whole host of other factors means that you get a wildly different bourbon in the barrels at the top than at the bottom. So at Four Roses, we just single story warehouse age. And that leads us, that gives us a little bit more control on what we age and how finely we can dial in what we're aging. So when you see other aging warehouses, you might think they're really Im impressive and tall buildings, and they are, don't get me wrong, it's incredible to see them. Um, but there's a reason that ours are quite low and shallow to the ground. Um, the other thing that we are known for, as Ben kind of mentioned, is the production is our yeast. So four roses, we are oh, perfect. <laughs> I had this all written yeah, yeah. down. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so we use five different yeasts each one imparting a different flavor. This is because when we were bought by Seagram's, they actually bought up a load of different distilleries and we were able to access different yeast strains. And over the years, we've been able to kind of cultivate the yeast strains that we think 
impart these flavors. So every whiskey we produce has a four letter code. The first letter will always be O and that stands for, there you go, Old Prentice Distillery. Uh, the third letter is always S because that stands for straight bourbon. And that's the only thing that Four Roses make as a straight bourbon. Um, so the two letters that vary are the second letter, which is our mash bill. And that will either be B or E. And you can see there the two different mash bills. So mash bill B is our high rye mash bill. So it's 35% rye and 5% uh, malted barley and then 60% corn. And then mash bill E, we call our low rye mash bill but actually it's still quite high in rye. It's 20% rye, which is still a significant chunk of it, 75% uh, corn and 5% malt barley. And then the five yeast strains there, v, v, K, O, Q, and F, all give different flavors. Um, and hopefully you guys will be able to uh, taste how they impart different flavors onto the whiskey today. Um, so whenever you see four roses, you might see O, B, K S O B K O, for example, and it's all about what yeast is in there and what mash bill is in there. So that gives us quite a lot of variety. It means we actually make ten different bourbons and age in our barrels ten different unique bourbons, and then are able to blend them all together. So small batch tens but uh, there's going to be one exception in the small batch select um oh this is amazing but this is better than, this is better than any imagery i could have um so the 10 bourbons we have our small batch and our small batch limited edition is always a blend of four different bourbons and they do vary and i'll give you exactly the makeup of the ones that we're tasting today uh and then our small batch select is a blend of six different bourbons we also have our original, which is a blend of all 10, and then our single barrel, which is just a single recipe. Um, the small batch bourbon was originally introduced uh, in 2006. It was actually the third one we made. So we made the original, which was all 10 recipes, and then the single barrel. But then a small batch bourbon was becoming more... Uh, more so after, especially in the United States, Four Roses thought, well, we have these 10 recipes. Let's make a, a unique blend of these these two, these two, four bourbons, sorry, um, and is quite a hard one to keep consistent. Brent Elliott, our, our master distiller, um, famously says, actually, it's probably the hardest bourbon we make because although the original uses 10, that actually gives us a lot of tools to, there you go, there's Brent there. <coughs> Uh, Brent's been across to the UK a few times now and is is genuinely lovely. We will always make a song and dance about whenever he comes here. Um, and he doesn't just stay in London, which is the nice part. He's been up and down the UK. Um, but yeah, Brent has said that the original in 10 different recipes gives a lot of dials to tune in to the flavour profile that we need. Whereas small batch being only four means that actually there's fewer fewer knobs to turn, so to speak, and it becomes a little harder to make sure that it stays consistent and stays at exactly the flavour profile that we want. Uh, but hopefully you guys will all agree when we come to taste it that he, he does a pretty good job of it. Um, so that's kind of the history of Four Roses in a nutshell. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the Small Batch Select quickly in that that was introduced in 2019 and was the last... Uh, addition to the core range it was our fourth rose so to speak um, and because in the United Kingdom we like the small batch so much we actually sell a significant chunk of the small batch that's sold throughout all of Europe um, so we were able to get the small batch select in the UK before I think it was before about 30 states in the United States were able to get it um, it's made in such a, a small batch that I think every year in the UK we, we get about 4,000 bottles. Um, and then the limited edition, we, we get around the 1,000, 1,500 mark. Um, so it's not something that we're, we're able to um, say we have lots of, and it's something that we tend to see kind of come out the door as quickly as it comes in. Um, but it's nice to be able to have it and have the fourth permanent skew as well as the limited editions that we get. 
And yeah, that's right kind of the history of Four Roses in a very quick nutshell. Um, yeah. If anyone's got any questions, please feel free to, to either type them or, or, or shout them out. Um, yeah. Obviously, I'll talk more about each individual skew as we go through and taste them. Yeah. Oh, I've just noticed Chris is on here. So that's good. Uh, he's on mute, but good to have you with us, buddy. Uh, glad to be here. Been in London with the kids for four days, so well, I'm truly sick of them. So, uh, oh Jesus, thought I'd come and get on the call. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Um, right. So, um, the only uh, the only other thing I'll, I'll, I'll probably just add in there, only because I put a picture of him on the um, on the the deck that I I put together was um, so there, there is obviously the legend about uh, so so Paul Jones is is the uh, the founder of the distillery and um, that there is that kind of story of him meeting the Southern Bell uh, with the Four Roses and the Corsairs etc. There is also an, a, a sort of this other legend about the um, uh, the distiller being set up by a guy. That, so it's this guy, Rufus, Rufus Matthewson Rose, who uh, was a liquor wholesaler and a distiller in Georgia who moved to Tennessee with his brother and two sons. So they were the family of Four Roses. But the name for the whiskey was actually trademarked 10 years before they even moved to the state. So it very much seems to be one of those where it sounds like it's a really good story that, that fits in nicely, but actually everything else is kind of like, no, that's absolute nonsense. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was, yeah. Sorry. No, go on. But yeah, there's, there's a few things I think like that in the whiskey world. We love a, a romantic story, um, but often it doesn't always pan out that way. Um, I always like to tell people that we are one of five distilleries to have lived through Prohibition, World War One, and World War II. Um, and people often think we made it through prohibition by kind of under the counter selling of whiskey. Um, the real truth is that we we had a medical license and Four Roses was sold as a prescription. So it's much much less the bootlegger story and more the uh, we were we were sold really as a, as a medicinal at the time. Um, yes. So yeah, you tend to get a few myths and legends around. I think bourbon and history, especially back to that time frame. So let's. Uh... If we do that and then let us go on to so I've got um I've put a little screen up for, for each one of them where I've pulled off the um basically the uh, the mash bills that is used for each one off the website. Um right. so so if we move on to the small batch, um and we've also got so the chocolate that uh, Chris has made for this is the Heather Honey. So this is the kind of speckled blue one. So, Chris, do you just want to um, kind of let us know in terms of uh, just what you want us to do in terms of the chocolate, the best way that, that you think is kind of like tasting the chocolate, tasting the whiskey? You know, is it like take a sip, take a bite, take a sip? I've, I've got a little plate with a knife to kind of chop them in half and quarters if I can do, just so that I can take a little bit at a time. Um, but what, what's, what would be the ideal way for, for you to, to kind of um, uh, to go through this? Yeah, so usually what I'd do is I'd say have some of the chocolate and then some of the some of the whiskey. But um, with these, I think having the whiskey first and then the chocolate, um, just because of the fact that everything's kind of coming from that consistent approach that Four Roses have, what I've tried to do is not necessarily match the flavour profile, but give something that makes the whiskey uh, a little more um, not interesting because it's really interesting and it's delicious whiskey. Uh, but just to kind of supplement or clash sometimes against the flavor profile of the whiskey so if you have the whiskey first and then some of the chocolate and then go back to the whiskey hopefully it'll slightly change the experience for you oh i'm already on the chocolate oh my god mate oh oh this is it's this this is so good right so um so callum if um if you want to give us a bit of a i'll pop the um i'll pop the screen up for um the uh, the small batch so we're going to start with the the standard small batch i can't oh mate i'm going to need one of those little baby ones is that a half bowl no no it's a full size i've just got is that a full a size one have you just got really big hands i thought i really genuinely head, thought yeah. it was like oh he's got like a 20 cl or something oh, that's really cool uh, well, my I'm god weird. man you're a giant <laughs> yeah i uh, i just have, have a big head and a big hand <laughs> um so yeah um uh, sorry, I'm I'm still enjoying that chocolate. That was really, really good, by the way. 
<laughs> so yeah, this is the standard small batch. And like I say, this was uh, first released in 2006, I think. Um, although I'll double check that. Yeah, 2006. And as you can see there, it's a split between our mash bills. So two recipes using the B mash bill and two recipes using the E mash bill. So we're always pretty confident in telling people the makeup of this is about 30% rye. It's a 45% ABV spirit. So it's got a fairly good texture and punch. And it's got two different yeasts as well. So it's got the K yeast and the O yeast. What that means is that you should get plenty of that uh, kind of baking spice, cinnamon, um, mace flavor, and then you should get some of that really kind of, uh, as, it, as it says on the on screen, you should get some of that rich fruit. So I always think with this, uh, plums, cherries, um, and then it kind of finishes with that oaky vanilla. Um, and it's got enough texture from the ABV and enough kind of peppery spice from the rye that for me is an all day, all purpose bourbon. Uh, we, we tend to at Four Roses call this our lunchtime bourbon because you can pretty much start at 12 o'clock with this and spend your day drinking it. Um, if you're making drinks at home, this is for me the perfect kind of old fashioned or Manhattan bourbon. It's has got that kind of rye character and ABV to stand up for things. With that, this is my um, my old fashioned whiskey of choice, absolutely. And um, so, Chris, what was your um, what was your thinking behind the um, behind your heather honey on this one? Yeah, so I think has everyone on the call done a chocolate evening with us before? Ben, are there any? There's a couple of new ones on this, and we've not got as many on the call as packs that have been sold so there's going to be a lot of people kind of coming to this Packing late um so they'll Don't be worry. kind of like watching the watching this afterwards so um there, there is a there is a few that have done the chocolate ones before do you mind if i kind of give a bit of a how i normally approach and then how i've sl slightly absolutely mate yeah this is a so done quite a few of these with ben now and absolutely love doing the tastings um Ben's opened my eyes to quite a few spirits that I've never come across before. And it's always a real challenge to try and make sure that I do the spirits justice because the focus of the evening is undoubtedly the spirits and the chocolates are just there to supplement and give you a little bit of a different dimension. Um, quite often, though, it's really easy for me to just kind of pick up a flavour profile and run with it. Because this is single distillery, the only other single distillery evening we've done was a Catoctin Creek one and they were all cask finishes. So even though it was single distillery, there was really wildly different profiles and it was it, it would have been quite tempted i think to to try and just pick out the notes that you get with with the the mash bills and the recipes um but what i've tried to do differently this time is look at the spirits within a set of five rather than just i'm going to make a chocolate to go with the small batch i'm going to make a chocolate to go with the small batch select i've tried to look at them as as a piece, as a, a full kind of concert across the evening and then pick out where I think they sit within each other in terms of the recipes that I've tried to put together. So for me, with the small batch, um, just to say with all the chocolates you've got this evening as well, um, so I'm quite, I'm quite picky and uh, quite particular about what chocolate I use. Um, and I use quite a few different recipes for the chocolate itself before we even start get into the flavouring and the, the structure of the ganaches or the caramels or whatever it is. Um, but I've decided because of the, the relatively high alcohol content um, for the, the selection you've got this evening to use the same shell for all of the chocolates that you've got. So all of the uh, shells are made from a 70.5% cocoa mashed chocolate. Um, and the beans for that chocolate come from three different places. So they come from the Ivory Coast, from Ghana, and from Ecuador. So what you get is a really, really nice, not particularly bitter, but certainly not sweet chocolate that's also got quite a robust flavour profile that stands up to the alcohol content. Um, the reason I went with the, with the honey for the small batch was, uh, as I say, kind of amidst those five whiskies that you've got, this for me was was the earthiest of the the five. Um, I got 
quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of that rich fruit coming through on the palate. But on the nose, I got some more delicate fruits. I got a little bit of pear, um, so it was giving me that that very natural kind of nature feeling. Um, and I made uh, honey chocolates in the past, but I tend to use a, a, a Scottish clear honey from the Highlands. Um, this was just a little bit more a little bit more floral um and i wanted the, the chocolate to to match that so i uh, went searching and i've managed to find a really nice yorkshire heather honey um so hopefully when you have the chocolate you'll get those floral notes coming through and it, it will be quite a grounded chocolate and um, the, the ganache itself is made from 54.5 percent dark chocolate so everything's dark but the, the center is not as dark as the shell uh, and it, it should just stand up to and hopefully kind of for me as well this one had the 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 most obvious alcohol content even though it's not the highest alcohol content of the evening the higher contents that you're getting later for me were much smoother um so this hopefully is quite a text is quite important when i make ganaches as well um so this has got quite a, a an oily mouth feel in the ganache which comes partly from the honey but also a higher butter content to give a slightly higher fat content to the ganache so it should cling to the mouth and so, uh, smooth out that alcohol content a little bit it's amazing mate it's absolutely brilliant um does anybody have any well any thoughts any comments on um i well the whiskey or the chocolate um or both you know the, the the pairing between the two um i'm trying to find the button which oh god where's it gone uh hang on i'm trying to find the button which says invite to unmute i can't now oh no oh there we go hang on that one that one so yeah does anybody have any uh any thoughts any comments on either the whiskey or the chocolate or both or not You've stunned them into silence, both of you. It's a good well, job. When I'll the chocolate say, was so good, I had to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I'll say that chocolate was incredible. And I, I, again, whether you meant to or not, that bitterness that came through paired really well with that kind of baking spice finish that I get on the small batch. I think it was incredible. I would, I would eat a dangerous amount of those chocolates. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 a great pairing, and yeah, it's it's odd how, like you say, it's it's the the lowest ABV of all of them, and yet it's the one that's kind of the got the most bite, but in a good way. It's not like it's like a you know it's hot or anything like that. It's it's um, it's interesting because I've just taken a sip of the Select, which is seven percent higher, and yet feels a lot richer. It's really really surprising um so speaking of which let's uh let's move on to uh to number two then so this would be um so this is the small batch select yeah, okay. so cal do you want to give us a rundown on uh, on this one yeah absolutely so yeah as ben said this is a small batch select uh it is seven percent higher in abv so this is 52 percent uh and like i said this was kind of the fourth permanent addition to the range and i think what we the it, it was there was a 13 year gap before we added something permanent to our range and i think the reason for that is brent was really keen on making sure that if we added something it it, it was for a, a reason it wasn't just to have another skew to sit alongside the others it, it served a purpose so this one is a mid, well, it's a blend of six and seven year olds in general, but there are sometimes a little higher. Uh, it's non chill filtered, and it's the only one in our core range that isn't chill filtered. And what that does is give it a bit more of a of a meatier, richer texture, almost buttery. Um, it's a blend of six recipes, and it uses uh, F yeast, K yeast, and V yeast. Uh, the K being your spice, the V being your light and delicate fruit, and the F being your herbal, um, which is a little bit of uh, you've you've put mint down there, which I think is pretty much bang on the on the nose. Um, mint for me is is that kind of almost spearmint on the finish, which I think is very unique for this kind of whiskey. Um, and what we what we found is that people were looking for a bourbon that had a bit more body, a bit more ABV and 
this is, I think, probably the best in our range to bring across anyone who's an avid scotch drinker, especially a single malt drinker, but maybe isn't quite so keen on the, the sweetness that you tend to find in bourbon. This is is perfect for bringing them across because it's got that body and it's got that slightly higher ABV from not being chill filtered. Oh, sorry, the body from being non-chill filtered and a higher ABV. Um, and yeah, um, it's it's gone down a storm. We got it. Uh, I think our first bottle arrived in uh, October 2020. Uh, so just a few months after it released in the United States. Um, and we were we were over the moon to have it before some of the some of the United States have it. I think they were a little bit jealous, to be honest. So um, yeah, cheers, everyone. It, it's um, honestly amazing the difference trying one and then the other, in just in terms of that texture, that richness, that that fruity richness, silky note that's coming through there is um, side by side is is just like it's night and day. It's amazing the difference between the two. Um, yeah. So yeah, Chris, it, it's just leading. Yeah, got this being a small batch select versus a small batch because yeah. I think in terms of character they are so different. Um, very, very different. Yeah, it's a different purpose, but yeah, um, yeah, lovely, lovely whiskey. So Chris, what was the uh, what was the thinking behind this then? Yeah, so I was really tempted to go with something kind of menthol. Um, I played around with a couple of mint recipes, but um, the texture played a really big part for me. Um, it's really, really nice that you, you've both already mentioned that. Um, whereas with the last one, I, I use that kind of high fat content in the ganache to, to give you that mouth coating. Um, with with this, we've gone with a white chocolate. Um, it's very, very unlike the the famous white chocolate that you'd pick up in most supermarkets um, in that it's actually got quite a high cocoa content. So it's got 28% cocoa. Uh, in the white chocolate. Now, just to kind of contrast that, um, the purple wrapper, uh, which is a milk chocolate, only has 27%. So uh, a lot of the, the difference in terms of the colour of the chocolate isn't necessarily always the cocoa content. It's also how much milk solids going in there as opposed to oils and fats. Um, so this is 28% cocoa, and it's got 22% minimum milk solids in the chocolate that I used for this, uh, for the centre. Um, straight away uh, on the palate, I got I got red berries and I got apricot, and as I say, I got that menthol note as well. Um, but the the apricot was the really interesting one for me, and to avoid going down the menthol route, but still give it that kind of almost medicinally esque element to it, I decided to add some Madis uh, Madagascan vanilla in there as well. What you'll get with the with both of the chocolates that I've got white centers tonight is that the flavor is actually really subtle and I, I tried to use it more as a, a seasoning than anything. Um, so with this one, hopefully what you'll get is the vanilla comes on quite strong in, in the first instance, but then after you've swallowed the chocolate, then the apricot will start to come through as a bit more of an umami sensation and a bit more at the back of the throat than on the, on the front of the palate. Um, and it, it should almost... I, or the way I designed it was to was to uh, kind of complement and contrast the the liquid at the same time. Uh, any thoughts on this? Because this is this is one where again, because of the texture of the chocolate, you could almost take a bite, give it a minute, and then have a sip, and it changes it yet again. It just kind of like they're both playing each, off each other absolutely brilliantly. Chocolates aren't big enough. That's the that's the one problem, Chris. Is they're just they're not big enough. They need to be yeah, about like three yeah, or four yeah. times the size. You should, you should see them in Carl's hand. That's <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm resisting the urge to just chomp it in one bite, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing probably the most delicate bites I've ever done in my life. So I can enjoy it alongside, but yeah, yeah, the texture inside is so is so rich and buttery, and reminds me of that texture of the small batch select. I think if you if you just ate the honey chocolate and then the apricot chocolate together, though, you wouldn't feel it's as buttery. I think it's the whiskey that does that. Mm. So as as I say, the fat content in this one is considerably lower than it is in the in the honey chocolate. Um, but that's because I didn't think it needed anywhere near because of how mm. smooth and how well the the whiskey coats your mouth. That did the work for me for the chocolate. Any thoughts uh, in the room about the the select compared to the small batch and how we're feeling about that? Well, you know, I love the small batch, Ben, and it was yes. very popular in some of the stuff we've done. But 
Yeah, that select just leaves it standing, doesn't it? In a lot of ways, it I mean, does that's, actually. Yeah, it's, that's yeah. no, that's no disrespect to the small batch, but but no. that select is, um, yeah. you know, it it's it's a different league. They, they, you've just stepped up into into you know, Blanton's gold type territory in terms of yeah, uh, yeah, differential. for half the price. Half the price <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's a yeah. real it's a, and I'm not comparing the two in terms of their flavor profile, but in terms of the impact they have as uh, as a bourbon that is a yeah we uh, so, so like I said we we say small batch is our lunchtime bourbon right and I, I kind of think that comes apparent when you try small batch select um, in that we call that our nighttime bourbon um, you 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 probably don't want to drink well mm, I say this I do. But um, I would drink any of them all day long. So I think most people would try small batch select and think that's that is a late night bourbon. That is, you know, mm. a, 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 you know, a, a one to to really kind of enjoy throughout an evening. Um, whereas small batch is for me the the quintessential kind of daytime daytime bourbon. Um, so yeah, they they tick different boxes for people, and it's it's kind of a joy to to have both alongside each other. So for people who tend to like whiskey and no whiskey, the small batch select is the one that they tend to gravitate towards. But that small batch is the one that it's a bit, you know, rawer in terms of that ABV does come through a bit more. Um, it is a little younger. It tends to sit around the the kind of six year mark, whereas the small batch select is a little older, blending in some seven years on average. That select is a lot more approachable than the single barrel. I mean, I love the single barrel. You know, yeah. I've, I've got it at the house, but that you can just tip, pour it and drink it. Where the single barrel, you've got to go, I'm going to drink this now. And it's a deciding thing that you're going to do, if you, if you know what I mean. It's a, Which is odd, yeah, I think, because the single barrels, again, are, it's in between the two in ABV. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I think yeah. because the single barrel is just the high rye, mm -hmm. uh, whereas this is a blend and sits... A, tends to be around the kind of 32 percent give or mm -hmm. take um obviously that varies year on year um but it's it's not got that kind of peppery finish mm. as much and i think that yeast really comes through in the in the small batch select um and for me it's a great great way of kind of showcasing that you've got these liquids all coming from the same distillery and really it's where the yeast kind of impacts flavor shows through why you taste yeah. things like this and Chris, you're absolutely right. When you take it with the chocolate, the, the f different flavors appear. I mean, it's like drinking dessert wine with dessert, isn't it? I mean, you, I hate it on its own, but you put it with dessert, it's great. And to take that that chocolate in your first bite, it's like, oh, and then you put that with it, it's wow. So, yeah. Sterling job again. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's funny. I, I don't know why, but I've always... I, I'm looking at, at the select in a completely new light tonight, just having had it side by side with small batch. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because it's, I, I've just gone, well, it's like the next level of small batch and that sort of thing. I've always kind of gone, original is good, small batch is really good, single barrels, really, really good. And it's like good, better, best. But actually, there's good, better, best. And then the select is the next one up, like even best, bester. It's um, you're right. It's it's. I, I actually prefer this to the single barrel. This is now my favourite of of the whole core range. It's absolutely amazing. It's so good. Um, but I've never really tweaked it until having it tonight side by side with the small batch and realising just how much of a, a step up it is. It's so um, much, it's, it's absolute. The name select makes it sound like it's the same stuff. You've just picked a good barrel. I think that's what it, I think that's what it is. I think in my head, I've kind of gone, yeah, it's it's like uh, you know they, they've taken the small batch and just they've literally taken the small batch and up the ABV and that's it. Whereas actually, no, there's a lot more in there. Um, and it's yeah, yeah. I, like I say, I think it, it is a bit of a misnomer, small batch select, because to be honest, it's got six recipes rather than four. The yeah. yeast are are different. We've used different yeasts in the select. It's non chill filtered. The ABV is higher. Um, I think the idea was just that it is made in small batches. It's a smaller, refined selection, hence the term small batch select. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it, you're right. It, it's, I, I don't know if it almost needs to be, you know, something like small batch, 
you know, like Private Selection or or Master Distillers Edition or oh, I hate the word exquisite. Don't don't I know you hate this quizzer. But <laughs> so, something something in front of Select that kind of like accentuates that this is this is not your your small batch. This is like a you know this is the next level up. It's it's weird just calling it Select almost does it a disservice. Yeah, it's odd, and to be honest. I, from a from a personal point of view, it really threw how I did tasting sessions into a, a mix because w I used to have a really nice progression between original small batch and single barrel, mm -hmm. and now now small batch selectors in the mix. I never know where to throw that in because I used to kind of go up in ABV and rye content, but yeah. then it steps down in rye content, but up in ABV, and it's got more than it's got more recipes than small batch, but. So it, it sits in a very odd, I think it takes everything that Four Roses do and highlights them really well. So it highlights mm. the fry content, highlights the the methods that we use and the mix of, of yeasts uh, and the complexity that we can get out of that. Um, but yeah, it, it is odd. I agree with you that it can be confusing, I think, for, for people seeing Small Batch small batch limited as well and then small batch select um, yeah, yeah seeing where it sits among them i think is is difficult sometimes just but just I'm, i don't I'm know do, do like streaming <laughs> services and call it small batch plus or something, <laughs> something like that premium right, so small batch premium small batch premium small batch premium <laughs> yeah does, does that mm. say that normal small batch isn't premium yeah, there'll be somebody in the marketing department somewhere going, no, 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 no. Right, so let's um, let's have a look at, so this is our first of the limited edition, limited edition barrel strengths. Um, so the the info is on the screen. Again, this is all, this is just cut and paste from the, uh, from the website. So, um, and this is with the, I'm really looking forward to this chocolate as well. As soon as I saw it on the list, I was like, oh yeah. Um, so this is with the peppered caramel, which is like the, the pink and kind of white grey uh, colour chocolate. Um, so, yeah, Cal, do you want to run us through this one then? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the 2021 limited edition. Uh, Ben's made a good point. Uh, everything that I, I tell people is always on the website. Four Roses are really open um, about everything you can see, our entire recipe and process all on the website. Um, I always think that's a really good thing to have you know, all your processes and, and information freely available. Um, whenever I do tastings like this, I always tend to forget a little bit afterwards anyway. So having it there is great. So this was the 2021 release. Um, it's a blend of a 16 year old OESV, a 16 year old OBSV, uh, a 14 year old OBSQ, uh, which is our like floral yeast, and then our 12-year OESK. So these, these next three that we're tasting are all a blend of four recipes. Um, having that 16-year-old and older uh, bourbon um, is quite nice, but actually, compared to previous years, this was one of our youngest limited editions. Um, but it was a really good showcase for the Q yeast and the V yeast, so that floral and light fruit flavours. Uh, for me, on the nose, it's much more warm, ripe berries, oak flavours. But then on the palate, I tend to get a little bit more of that orange peel, plum. Um, and then it kind of turns into uh, vanilla cream and dark chocolate for me on the finish. Um, it's a higher, it's the highest ABV we're going to taste tonight. So it's 57.1. Um and uh, I think, to be honest, when it was first released, it went a little little under the radar for a lot of people, the 2021. Um, and now, in hindsight, is seen as, as kind of an incredible flavour profile and, and showcase of, of yeast. Yeah, it is going for a lot of money now. <laughs> it has to be said. Oh, gee, Chris, mate. Holy crap. <laughs> This, right what is your thing about this because this is this is insane so this but my was god my absolute pick of the bunch um this 2021 um it was the first time i'd had it and it was just like yeah it was just fantastic it was exactly what carl said it was those flavors in that order um 
But the overriding thing for me was how creamy and how caramelly this was. So there was no point trying to fight against that. So it had to be a caramel. Um, uh, if anyone's bought my chocolates before, just my kind of standard, um, my, my regular flavor chocolates, or if anyone's been on a call with me before, um, you'll have heard me say that my salted caramel I started treat in 2020, but I'd been working on my salted caramel recipe just for my own consumption for about 15 years prior to that. So I'm pretty happy with my salted caramel recipe. Um, I think because I'm such a rye fan and because of the, the mixture of recipes that you've got in this, I really wanted to pull on the pepper notes to accompaniment with caramel. Um, so I started with a caramel recipe that's completely different to the one that I've been working on for all those years. So I started with a, a muscovado caramel to try and give give quite a dark note to the caramel. The caramel that I make anyway, um, I make just with granulated sugar, butter, cream. Um, but I take the caramel, so I won't go too, too chocolate geek on anyone, but if anyone's made caramel before, uh, or if anyone hasn't made caramel or the process changes depending on what you're trying to achieve some people will uh, cook the sugar down with water but you can do it that way or you can do it the right way which is my way you can cook the sugar down completely dry and the way i do it is i take it almost to the point of burning the sugar um the way you stop the sugar from burning is by then adding cream or butter and again for me the right way to do it is to add the butter the reason for that is because on a molecular level, what you're doing is you're adding more fats in, um, more solid in than liquid. So what you're doing is you're combining those sugar particles with more solids much more quickly, which gives you a much nicer texture. And then you add the cream in to finish. I started doing that, but I did it with a muscovado sugar to begin with for this caramel. And it, it just didn't quite work out. It, it, the, the muscovado ended up being too sweet. The pepper didn't really give the tone that I was looking for. It didn't balance that sweetness. So I went back to my original recipe um, and I did it just with the pepper. I didn't put any of the salt in that I usually put in. So I use a rock salt rather than a sea salt, which gives a really nice earthiness compared to most salted caramels, which generally use a sea salt. Um, and again, just without the, without the salt in there it didn't quite have the dimension that i wanted so went back to the drawing board again used the caramel base that, that i usually make added in a little bit less salt than i would add into my salted caramel and then put in quite a chunk of, of pepper um, and then i sieved all the additional peppercorns out and had this really nice smooth caramel finish and then i thought it's just it, it just needs a little bit more texture to it. So actually reincorporated those those pepper grinds. So as you're chewing it, you'll every now and again you might just get a little extra pop of pepper because you've bitten into one of the the, the little bits of peppercorn that's left in there. Um, I I haven't had a peppered caramel before. Um, I don't. I'm sure someone out there will have done one, but um, that yeah, that was my kind of take on getting to my my eventual recipe. But it's gone down so well. Uh, that I think I'll be adding it to the menu. Yeah, yeah I'll, 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 have a, I'll have a box, please. Just a full yeah. box of that. It's it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> I think, in particular, for this one, it's it because this uses two of our high rye that I always think gives black pepper flavors. Having the black pepper caramel is so just perfect for this one. I think they they absolutely nailed it. Thank you. There's little little bits of pepper coming through as well. Just that little bit of texture as well. It's just, which just works so, so well. Absolutely stunning. Cheers, brother. Any, uh, any other thoughts in the room? Apart from enjoying them, yes. No, what I, I was going to throw a totally different question in, actually. You talk of using multiple different yeasts. I've never come across that before. Now, is that peculiar to you at Four Roses, or is that peculiar more so to bourbons? Uh, that's a really good question. So when we were bought by Seagram's, I think originally Seagram's had access to over 100 yeasts. 
Um, but then as they started selling off assets, different yeasts were obviously sold with different different brands. Um, Four Roses, um, the old Prentice distillery is on like a, it used to be on, geographically you'd look at it as like a spoke of a wheel and there was five distilleries on this wheel. So we basically took the yeast from those five. As far as I'm, as far as I know, we're the only brand that uses multiple yeasts. There will be uh, a few others, I'm sure, out there. Um, MGP, I'm sure, have access to to various yeasts. Um, and I know we sell um, we we sell some liquid to other brands, so they will also use a, a different yeast recipe or different mm. yeast makeup. Um, but in terms of production <coughs> and control of it, we're the only ones I know in particular that use it to such a a high degree of flavor profile. Um, yeah. I think it is one of the things that with four, makes Four Roses unique among other bourbons um, because so much flavor, um, if, if well, anyone, <coughs> any, any brewers out there or home brewers, it is yeast that tend, yeast and water tend to impart the most unique flavor profiles. Um, oh yeah, and I, under, I can understand each location having their preferred brand but to actually yeah. do what you're doing and put in half a dozen in round figures together yeah. is somewhat different yeah it's 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 a really interesting and i think when um i think th we've just tried the small batch select i think that spearmint flavor that people pick up on is such a good example of that comes from yeast it, it does you know you don't get spearmint flavor from any charred oak barrel that I know of, and you don't get it from corn or rye. Um, so the fact that you can see the end result in a seven-year-old bourbon, like the small batch mm. select, still having character from the fermentation stage where it's going to 8% ABV, to me is really fascinating. And yeah, I think it's, as far as I'm aware, we're the, we're the only distillery that certainly that talks about yeast to such a degree. Um, Fair enough. Whether other distilleries do, and honestly, I don't know. No, just... you've, you've you've got me thinking now. I know there's a few. Um, there is there is an American distillery, and I think it's Wilderness Trail. Who the guys that set the distillery up actually used to be suppliers. Um, I think they were suppliers of yeast. I'm probably going to get, and this is going on YouTube, so I'm no doubt going to get comments going down. I'm going, oh, actually, I think it's that. But I'm sure it was it was Wilderness Trail or somebody like that where they they were actually originally supplying yeast to other distilleries. So they, they had all of that side covered um, and then got into the distilling process. But I can't really think of many that are as... Uh, kind of as open as Four Roses is saying, this is what we're doing. And I think I th there is actually, I, di I did see online when I was pulling pictures and everything together, there is actually now a tasting set, isn't there, of the 10 individual sets. Um, yes. So they, I think on the website, it's got like a, a, a video where you can go through each one and you can buy a, I think it's a 10 CL. I mean, if that were to come over here, that would be absolutely amazing. Just saying, Cal, we're, just we're saying. Trying. I promise. <laughs> but yeah. um, so you can try each individual one and it's um, stuff like that. I absolutely love where it's, it's looking at essentially, you know, one little aspect. And I, I think it's one of these things that, you know, for, for, sort of um you know novice whiskey drinkers or people that you know that they, they they just they drink whiskey that's it they don't really kind of look anything behind it that the amount of factors that are involved you know a lot of places will go on about the barrels that they use a lot of places will go on about the, the type of barley that's used not many places also talk about the yeast you know ben romer oh, that i used to work exactly, for they exactly. talked about the fact they used distillers rather than brewers because mm. that was a different flavor so it's it, it's one of those factors that you change that you you change a lot of you know you, you change the flavor profile in quite a big way oh definitely yeah. and as I, these three are very different very interesting mm. it's so. one of the it's one of the reasons i think the four roses original stands the stands up to the test as being a entry level bourbon with loads of complexity and flavor despite being 40% um, I know typically we tend to think of whiskey at forty percent as being a little on the uh, little on the thin or, or uncomplex and 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 not particularly a good showcase. 
Um, the reason I think Four Roses Original does a great job is the rye content, for one, and the fact that you've got five different yeasts giving different layers of flavour, which helps at a 40%. I'm a big fan of, of higher ABVs. I tend to drink more of the, the higher ABV ones that we're talking about now. Um, but the the Four Roses Original, we again, we, we call it our breakfast bourbon because it's lower in ABV, but it's got enough complexity. And I think, yeah, the yeast is, is a huge factor in that. Okay, so I've just cut the I've cut the next chocolate, and oh my god, my fingers taste amazing. Oh, I, I was looking forward How's to this chocolate. Well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've just spilled a load of bourbon over my fingers. It's fine. Um, right, so we'll move on to the next one. So this is so we've done the twenty twenty one limited edition. Um, so we're now on to the twenty twenty two. So Cal, do you want to give us a rundown on this one then? Yes, I can, absolutely. So this takes a slight step down in ABV. Uh, so this is 54.5 rather than 57. Uh, but this goes back up in age. So this has, uh, this will be a little bit lower in rye content, I think, than the last one, as it's got one of our high rye recipes and then three of our low rye recipes. Um, but the high rye is the oldest at 20 years old. Then we've got a 15-year-old of the OESK, which again is that kind of spice um, yeast. And then we've got two 14-year-olds, uh, the low rye F, which is our herbal, and the low rye V, which again is the baking spice. So for, for me on the nose, I tend to get that kind of really brown sugar oak flavor that kind of kind of tickles the top of my nose. Uh, then on the palate, I get a little bit more um, apricot and peach and kind of finishing into oak, baking spice and really ripe berries, um, you know, ripe cherries, dark raspberries, that kind of flavor profile. Um, sorry, I, I was just eating chocolate and absolutely not. Uh, right <laughs> Chris so you sent uh, me yeah, notes so just in case you couldn't make it but I absolutely get why you've done the chocolate to go with this because as soon as I tried this I got with and and Cal makes a brilliant point that it's got the more of the low rye so it's got that old fashioned D feel to it that more sweet and oak coming through and the orange and everything is oh mate go on then you're thinking behind this yeah, well, you just did it there. <laughs> um, I did, I did. Yeah, I'm just yeah. like, oh, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was exactly that. So the the, the rye content's much lower, so you're getting a lot less of that heat and pepper kind of spice and, and a lot more of the cooking kind of spice. It felt a little bit odd at first because I've used the milk chocolate centre for this. So the, the milk chocolate centre is 33% cocoa solids just contrasting that to the white that you had earlier that was 28. So there's only a 5% difference, but there's a little bit less milk content in there. So um, you've got a slightly darker chocolate than the white, but it's nowhere near as dark as the 54% the, the that we had in the honey chocolate. Um, but then I've added bitters into it. So I've, I've used a, a considerably sweeter chocolate, but then added bitter to it but it, really it was just in that pursuit of, of creating a kind of old-fashioned in a chocolate without putting the whiskey in because i knew you were having it with the whiskey um i originally played with um kind of original angostura bitters but it just had that too much of that kind of sharp almost worcester so worcester easy for you to say sauce element to it um, you know that acidity that comes at the back end and it killed off the orange really um the oranges that i've used are valencian so it's valencian orange zested and then the zest is cut down in the cream the juice is uh strained and then reduced to give uh almost syrup and then that's folded through the ganache right at the end just before it's blended and piped into the shelves um, so hopefully that contrast between the dark shell, which holds up against the alcohol, the slightly sweeter <clears throat> chocolate, but then the bitters will give you that sensation of, of having an old fashioned to go along with the whiskey that's almost an old fashioned, but not quite. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah it's, it's like a 54% old fashioned, isn't it? <laughs> Pretty much. 
It's interesting you put pastry in your tasting notes there for the chocolate because that's like I get creamy vanilla on the whiskey as well, and it just links the two so perfectly for me. Um, and yeah, it, it it tastes like I'm eating an old fashioned, which is no bad thing in my eyes. I, I think I think because of that slightly sweeter note, I think I prefer the twenty two over the twenty one. Not that the twenty one's not any good, but I think it, it ticks a couple more boxes for me. Um, but the, the chocolate absolutely brings more of that orangey notes out as well. Oh wow! I'm glad I've got a couple of spares. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And I'm going to have to take Vicky's off of her. That's her Valentine's <laughs> presents now gone. That's back in my fridge. Um, any thoughts? Any thoughts on this from the rest of the room? That combination's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely really brilliant. Chocolates out of this world. I, I mean, it's interesting. Mm. I preferred the bouquet on the previous one. Yeah, it's, me too. I, I prefer I the taste. The of this. You prefer twenty one overall. I preferred the bouquet of the twenty one, uh, but the bouquet of the twenty one <clears> is very different to the taste of the twenty one. And twenty one is brilliant, but I think the the bouquet was better. But the flavour for me of the of the, of the twenty this last one twenty two is just brilliant. But sorry, <laughs> sorry to say. The chocolate wins that battle. Winner out of that head to head. The the. I, I think that the the chocolate wouldn't be as good if you weren't drinking the whiskey with it. Oh, don't, put it do. don't, don't put it down. Don't don't put yourself down. Don't put yourself down. All I'm going to say is I found the perfect accompaniment to all of this lot. I've had to go and get a slice of self cooked bannock, and it just works perfectly. <laughs> Well, you you know the rule you've got to bring for everybody if you're going to sit in the chair, so you should have sat there long. <laughs> it's uh, really interesting what you said about the, the, the nose there, though, Brian, as well, because the, the nose on this was the most complicated <clears> one for me. This this was doing more for me before I'd even put it mm. to my lips than a lot of the others did, yeah. um, even with in, including the palate. It, it was really, really diverse, the nose on this one for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and and even at that stage, it was setting me up with what I wanted to do with the flavours for the chocolate. Yeah. Oh, Lee's, uh, it, it, if you haven't got uh, the chat, Lee's gone. Um, the twenty two is stunning. The chocolate, though, so I think he likes the chocolate. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. amazing stuff. You're gonna have um, to when you do the vote at the end, Ben. You're gonna have to do a double one about whether you prefer the chocolate over the whiskey as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Somebody's somebody's going to be a bit upset after that one. <laughs> oh, honestly, I think I'm, my battery's dying, Ben. I think, I think. <laughs> I'll lose that chocolate every day long, and I'm, I'm all right with can you imagine, well, can you imagine, like Cal's boss is going to be like, "Oh, that uh, that tasting you did last night, how did it go? Uh, yeah, yeah, it went really well, but they all preferred the chocolate." <laughs> yeah, don't check YouTube for the vote. Yeah. Yeah. You don't look at YouTube, don't you? I was just going to say, Ben, I think you need to give up doing the whiskey tasting with chocolate. It needs to be chocolate tastings with whiskey. Yeah, maybe that was... very <laughs> Cal, if they want to fly me out to Kentucky for a couple of months and work on flavour profile, then I'm... Uh... <laughs> I, I definitely, yeah. <laughs> I'll put that one next to the trip. I'll make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll it's, a, it's, a two, it's, a, it's a two for, though. Two for one, all right? Yeah, it's, <laughs> you're not getting yeah. all of this, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> to, be, to be fair, Chris, you've just said that. All that proves is you've never been to Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> right. So let's go for the last one. So this is the 135th anniversary. So it's not known as the the 2023 edition. It's the 135th anniversary small match, yeah. um, which came out in is it October? September, October, uh, I think it was. November, I think. Stock. November, well, yes. Yeah, yeah. October, we yeah. got stuck in November, I think, finally. Yeah. Uh, we always tend to be uh, just a fraction behind release Yeah. Because um, I remember so, it yeah. got released in the States and a lot of people were like, oh, is it coming over here? When are we getting it? Well, you know, are you getting any of that sort of thing? So, yeah, we, I think I might have emailed you going, Cal, <laughs> are we getting any of this? <laughs> I think, yeah, I think it was when I was sleep deprived and, and just stumbling around and I was like, I'll get you some, I promise. Oh, God, yeah, because you, you just had a kid, haven't you? Yes. And uh, you were like, yeah, my, my baby is due next week. I'll see what I can do. And I'm like, Cal, <laughs> forget your baby. I want the bottle. It's okay. We got your stock. That's all that mattered. That's, That's all fine. That yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, um, yeah. This is the 135th um, edition, so we we always try and landmark our, our five year anniversary um, because it is it you know it's it's nice to have that history of being one of the the five to have made it through World War One, Prohibition, and World War Two, um, when so much uh, bourbon producing history kind of died off during that time. Um, so this is the 135th. It's the lowest of the three that we're taste the three limiteds that we're tasting only by a fraction. So this is fifty four percent ABV. Uh, this is also the oldest in that it's got a twenty five year of the high rye, uh, light and delicate fruit. So twenty five years uh, of aging in Kentucky. I always try and explain to people is uh, it's. It's vastly more than 25 years of aging in, say, Scotland. Um, just because of climate, um, the heat in Kentucky during the summer pushes the, the liquid into the barrel <coughs> further, and then the cold in the winter draws out so much uh, liquid that you get a constant in, out, in, out that extracts flavour. So 25 years is is... I, I don't know what the equivalent would be, but I would guess you're looking at the complexity of flavour of a, about a 35-year scotch. On top of that, there's then three low rye bourbons added in there. We've got a 14-year-old OESK, uh, which is our uh, spice baking, spice kind of cinnamon uh, yeast. And then we have uh, the first one in that we're tasting where there's two of the same recipe. So there is an OESV 12 year and an OESV 16 year. So they are both using our light and delicate fruit yeast um, with our low rye recipe. Um, this I think is uh, for me, the most whiskey like on the nose in that I get a lot of kind of all spice um, baking spice and vanilla on the, on the nose, along with that kind of hint of oak. But then palette-wise, I get a lot of kind of, a, you know, Ben summed it up there with his flavour notes, I get loads of honey and I get loads of smooth vanilla into a really long, soft finish of pear, hint of clove, and then that kind of oaky caramel. Um, that just comes through really, really nice. Um, I think this is uh, going to, I, I don't know, but I, I would hazard a guess that within a couple of years, this will be very fondly looked back on as, a, as an anniversary and a, a limited edition. Yeah, very much so. Um, and it's interesting that the, the chocolate's not as, the pairing on this isn't as in your face as the previous two. But it actually works really, really well, and um, and it's very much one where you, on this it feels like you almost need to put the chocolate with the, the whiskey rather than separate the two. It's it's not as kind of like as upfront, but it really it's funny kind of nosing nosing the whiskey than nosing the chocolate and having a taste of each and kind of almost like combining the two in the mouth brings more out from the whiskey that was there already. Yeah, yeah this, that, that was a Aaron, I was the most excited to try just looking at flavor profiles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to do with this, Ben. It, it was um funny that you said earlier about having the um the apricot chocolate and then leaving it a minute before you went back to the whiskey. Um because that was absolutely intentional as well. But with this, I think I think the the profile of the whiskey is so whilst there are still lots of things going on it just felt so much more succinct than some of the others so it it, it made sense for me just to give you a chocolate that is going to let the whiskey really really shine rather than try and pull particular features out so what the yuzu does and yuzu was really faddy a couple of years ago it was just everyone was making everything with yuzu in it it was awful they would yuzu beef wellingtons on menus and everything it was horrendous <laughs> but it's got its place um in that as I said at the start, some of the ingredients that I've used are almost seasonings. So just think kind of um, making um, 
making a, a Victoria sponge, you might put a squeeze of lemon juice in there just to help everything come together. Yuzu does the same sort of thing, but with a, a more aggressive citrus profile. Um, so there's a very small amount of yuzu um, pure right gone into a very similar white chocolate ganache to the one you had with apricot, but without any additional vanilla added in. Um, and it is really designed just to just to let the whiskey sink uh, and just give you a slightly different dimension and draw out some of those softer fruits that you get on the finish. I'm, I'm going to put my hand up here, and I actually think I've done... I think I've done both of you a disservice here because I think because of the flavor profile of the 130 fear, I actually think this should have been first out of the limited editions. I was just going to say that. Yeah. I, 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 I yeah, I think, I, I think if, if I'd have put this, yeah, I think if this had gone first before the, the, uh, the 21 and the 22, I think it would have had more of an effect. I think we, we would have been looking at this, not, not that it's bad, but I think the, the other two with the chocolates, this, is, this, this feels more refined than the previous two. It feels better balanced, but it, it, it feels like it's... Select. It needs to be compared to the Select, not the yeah, other two. Yeah, yeah. They are so yeah. punchy. They are so yeah. hard-hitting, and this is not. And I think you're absolutely right. So mm. I'm glad that you realised the mistake you've made because I was going to explain it to you in great detail. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. Well, Cheers I, for that. I thought you'd done that on purpose, Ben, because to me, the 135 is most whiskey drinkers' whiskey, I think, yeah. of all of them. And I think the, the Yuzu almost works, that kind of really light touch of citrus from the chocolate works as like a palate cleanser. So yeah. I thought you'd done it all on purpose. I thought you were just really ahead of the curve there. <laughs> 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 flavor profile. If only. Shit, I should have kept my mouth shut, shouldn't I? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think it's, um, I think it loses a bit of its impact compared to the previous two because the previous two are much more upfront, um, much more in your face, more, more kind of extremities, and then obviously the chocolates have been, you know, we had, we had the orange, we had the pepper. And then we've we've kind of got a bit more refined and a bit more uh, subdued on on the last one, and it, it might have maybe done it a bit of a disservice, I think. Um, but you know, it's that that's hey, we live and learn. And and next time I do this one, which isn't going to happen, um, <laughs> we'll know for next time. Um, it, it's a great combination, and I, I, I absolutely love I love the Yuzu. Um, I just I, yeah, I, I genuinely think we've had two kind of like extremes and and we've just kind of plateaued a little bit in terms of this is this is a much more delicate mm -hmm. subtle one that's maybe kind of lost a bit of its impact because of what we had beforehand mm -hmm. but that's on me that's hey that's the way it goes that's the fun of it still bloody good though i'm not gonna turn it down yeah. so so that is the five um uh, thank you so much to Cal for running us through those. Uh, and again, Chris, for putting those chocolates together. Absolutely amazing stuff. Uh, you'll also note that there is the um, the jelly that, whoop, that I nearly dropped on the floor. Um, so the jelly is made with, uh, so that's made with small batch. And I ask you this every time because I can never remember. So what's your process of making these jellies? Because it blows my mind how you managed to do this. Uh, so it's... Um quite a bit of the whiskey. Uh, so I've get probably about 40 jellies out of about 200 mils of the whiskey. So it's, it's really um, reduced down to try and bring the flavor through as much as possible. But then very little else is done with it. It's slightly sweetened um, and then some gelatin added. It's raised to about 136, one, well, I say about 136. It's 136 to 137 Celsius. Uh, anything else and you're going to end up, anything higher, you're going to end up with a, a real hard, chewy uh, catastrophe and anything below that and it's not going to set. So it's all pretty uh, pretty specific in terms of temperature. Um, the real nice thing about the, the process that, that I've got, though, is that I think it, well, I hope it really lets the, the profile of the, the whiskey that I use shine. Um, so one of the um, sets that I, I used to sell on the website was a McMira whiskey jelly tasting set where we used to do the Svensk, the Ruck, and the uh, one that I can never say, Ben, the Brooks Fisky. Oh, Brooks, Brooks Whiskey, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, so I used to do those three, and, and, and it was um, 
quite apparent, I think, that which one was which because it allows that, that profile to come through. Um, interesting thing about gelatin is that it never stops working. Uh, so the longer you leave gelatin, once you've managed to start the setting process, the, the harder the jelly will get. Um, so these were made last Tuesday to make sure I got them to you in time to go out, albeit skin of the teeth in the end. <laughs> um, but it, it'll just be starting to firm up. Um, so if you if you pop it in and, and let it just loosen a little bit in your mouth as your mouth temperature raises the, the temperature of the jelly, um, it'll start to release the, the oils from the whiskey. Um, you can just pop it in and chew it. Nothing wrong with that at all, but just letting it come to temperature in the mouth a little bit is the best way to go. Singly the best yeah. fruit pastel I've ever had. And that's exactly what I was going for. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know. I don't know. The purple ones are pretty good, though. The purple ones are good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, do. Yeah, you, are. you make a good point. Um, right. So, um, as with the tastings, and this will be going out on email to everybody, because I, I now have a bad feeling that despite the fact I sent an email out, there will be people thinking that we're having this tasting on the 8th of March. Um, we're just with being so few. But this is going to go onto YouTube. This is going to, these details are going to get emailed out to the people on the tasting. Um, I have got, um, I've got one bottle of the 2021. I've got one bottle of the 22. And I've got two bottles of the 135th. Um, these are going for silly money at the moment, particularly the 21, which seems to have gone absolutely crazy. I saw a bottle for uh, 400 quid um, on some whiskey site. It's absolutely insane. So uh, I will do my usual 10% off the small batch and the small batch select, which I've got a couple of bottles in and I can get in um, because I'm going to be probably putting an order in anyway. So if it does say it's sold out, let me um, get in touch if you want to get one. I'm going to order some more in anyway. Um, but I'm also going to, for the people on the tasting, uh, oh, hang on, let's not do that one and do that one. Um, so for until Tuesday, um, I've got the 21 at 249.99 and then the others at 17499. Now, these are 250 plus at the moment um and what i'm probably going to do from tuesday is if they're not gone i'll put them on the website but there'll be a bit extra on um that's more than a 10 percent, to be honest um for what it will probably go on at but i'd rather it go to people who are actually on the tasting than somebody somewhere that just sees it online and snaps it up um but if you do want small batch and small batch select, um, if you use the code, that's going to go to the end of the month. You'll get 10% off the small batch and the small batch select. And maybe if I've already done the code and done the other ones, the original and the single barrel as well, you may even get 10% off that. But I'm not saying officially, but I might have put it on there as well. Um, if you do want the the limit any of the limited edition ones let me know because i've not put it on the website it's on the system i've just not launched it onto the website yet send me a message email give me a ring whatever um and it will basically be a first come first served my thought was if there were more people on the tasting and people wanted it i might have to do a little kind of toss a coin or anything but there's not as many as i thought so i'm going to leave it open uh, I'll send an email out to everybody to let them know that that is the, the situation for, for the what I have remaining because um, it seems like everybody else is is sold out, particularly the, the uh, 21 and 22 because it's it seems to go on shelves and then absolutely disappears. And I've been sat on these for at least a year, at least a year, um, with a view of doing this tasting. Um, and then uh, we've got a couple of tastings lined up, again, online ones. Uh, 8th of March is the Stowning uh, Danish Rye Whiskey Tasting, uh, which is going to be really, really good. This is really interesting um, rye whiskies. Um, we've got some really unusual finishes. We've got a sweet vermouth finish, a mezcal finish, a mezcal and a uh, mezcal and chocolate stout finish, which is just absolutely gorgeous. And you get a free glass with it. Um, so that's on the 8th of March. And then I've just announced the uh, Lockley, the uh, second year of releases from them. That's going to include the five-year-old that came out 
last week, week before last, the UK exclusive single cast, which is all sold out. Um, there'll be a bonus dram in there, which is their uh, cast strength, because we missed that on the year one tasting that we did. Um, and then the four second crops of their seasonal editions. Um, so that is what is um, over the next couple of months. And then I'm working on some other bits and pieces as well. Um, and that is that. So thank you very much to Cal. Thank you very much to uh, Chris, as always. Um, is it worth doing some votes as to what favourites were or not? Or just likes? There's not many of us, is there? No. Nah. Nah, forget it. Um, but yeah, absolutely amazing. Chocolates, incredible. Just, just brilliant. Um, and such a good, such a good range of whiskies. Um, the, the limited editions were as good as I hoped they would be. Um, but honestly, the small batch select is the one that's, that's, that's blown my mind. Value wise, you can't beat that. That's... Yeah, I, I, I've completely um, changed my whole view of that particular bottling from tonight. It's, uh, it's really, really blown. Um, so, yeah, and hopefully, obviously, the people that didn't make it are going to be watching this and we'll send in messages in and going, hey, Chris. So, Chris is, I suppose, we, what, semi retired? You, um, you set yourself up during lockdown, but you, you got a, a full time teaching job back, at, was it last year? Yeah, I'd wanted to work in special ed for a long time before I had left my mainstream teaching post to set the business up and uh, an opportunity came up. So I am now a uh, full-time assistant at a specialist provision, um, but I managed to keep the business going to do things like this with Ben. Um, and I it just I don't retail anymore, but I, I am still in the kitchen regularly. So um, I'm available if you ever wanted to be in touch. If you if you would like anything, I'm sure I can make it for you. Um, yeah, just it's just nice and fun now. It just takes the pressure off. Uh, so if, if we do like a, a, a half, I can't order a box of that 2022 now. So <laughs> well, well, uh, yeah, yeah. If we do like a, you know, can you do like a bulk deal on say, you know, peppered caramel and orange and chocolate bitters, like you know, half well, palette or well, something like that? We'll, we'll figure something out. <laughs> I'll send you all the limited bourbon that you need, Chris. So <laughs> get it too. Now, Cal. You and I, <laughs> we're going to get a lot Did, of did we just become best friends? <laughs> <laughs> right, have a good weekend, everybody. You yes, too. Thanks, you too. Great thanks, to see you, you all. So thanks for Take care, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. All right.